want to welcome you all again to our uh, seminar series. Um, this is the, I'm not sure what number we are, but um, we've had it it's about, I think, week six probably. Um, next week, I believe we're having Lee Bukovic, and the week after that is Elliot Lefkowitz, and then the last session is going to be online, but I'll remind everybody each time. Um, make sure if you're on here that we have your email address because I communicate with you by email and I send you out the materials for the lectures after the, after the seminars. So that's the administrative business. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce for the second time, though some of you might have missed him the first time, Dr. Jim Semino, who is director of the UAB Informatics Institute. And today he's going to talk on clinical research systems and standards. Okay, thank you, Ida. Um, okay, I'll have a lot of things to touch on, and you'll be getting the slides, I guess, afterwards, so you'll have them for reference. Um, just to sort of recap from my last talk about what biomedical informatics is, there's a spectrum that goes from up from genetics and molecular biology through cell and organism and uh, all the way up to the patient and out to the community, and there's informatics along the whole way, from bioinformatics through translational, clinical research informatics, clinical informatics, population informatics. Today, I'm going to focus on systems that uh, sort of apply in the middle here in the clinical research informatics space. So um, we've got about six different topics to cover, six or seven, so I'll jump right in. So first is clinical research data capture. So when, you, when, when you're uh, doing clinical research, sometimes you can get the data uh, from other sources, uh, but if you need to capture your own data, you'll need systems, and there's a whole variety of things. I'm going to just touch on a couple. One of them is REDCap, uh, and the other is a patient-reported outcome system. REDCap is a, na is a uh, national system, and P PRO is a local system developed here. Uh, so REDCap is uh, from Vanderbilt University. It's a freely available system uh, set up and uh, people set it up in their own institutions. There's a map there showing you all the places in the world that it that it is from Iceland to, I don't know, so to South Africa. And it's, um, it's a, a system that will capture, allow you to design case report forms uh, or encounter forms that will capture the data uh, for, for you that you, you can put it in and patients can put it in. Uh, and you build your own database. It has the, as I say, case report forms, and it will support longitudinal studies, multiple multi-arm studies, branching logic in the questionnaires, all kinds of sophisticated uh, data collection forms. You can put in all kinds of data. You have multiple users and have various control privileges. So some people are only allowed to enter data. Others can, uh, you know, correct the data or um, analyze it. And it exports it to multiple different resources. And as I say, it's free. And we have a version here that's supported by the Department of Medicine and the CCTS. And there's a URL there for you if you're interested. So if you're looking to collect, uh, collect data and you don't want to do it in the Microsoft Excel or you don't want to do it on paper or you don't want to do it in a spreadsheet, you should definitely look into REDCap. It's very easy to use, very easy to set up. There's all kinds of tutorials to help you get started. Um, this is just a, some example forms, probably not readable to the people here, maybe online, uh, but you know, their demographic form, here's a, something where you would type in your labs and, you know, and your blood pressure and that kind of thing. So as you collect your data, you just enter it in there. And this last one is uh, uh, other, can capture full text uh, comments and such. The other system is the PRO system, patient reported outcomes. And it's actually a very general purpose system, but it, it's been focused on use it for um, patients uh, patients to enter their own data. It's a web-based platform. It's usable on a tablet, and it can be used in, uh, in care, healthcare settings or also at home by patients. Uh, you build basically a panel, specific panels from the library, and they have a library now of some 40 or so standardized instruments, and you can build your own, bring them together. These are just some of the examples that they have um, for, for doing this, and it's, you know, it's just a fairly simple um, user interface for, um, for data capture. This is just some of the graphics that it provides a summary of graphics. Okay, so that's research data capture. Then once you've captured your data, you need to manage it. Okay, you need you want to analyze it, you want to you know you want to store it, you want to merge it with other data. Uh, so then we start to deal with things called clinical trials data management systems, many of which also do the data capture, as you'll see. Uh, so I'm going to talk about so RedCap, uh, as I mentioned, also does 
tr clinical trials data management. Uh, here, though, we have Encore, which is going to be integrated with our, or is integrated with our uh, clinical information system, and Power Trials, which is the um, is the component of our clinical information system that actually captures and monitors the uh, patients uh, who are in clinical studies while they're in, in the hospital. Okay, so the clinical trials management system, lots of pieces to this. Uh, we've got a protocol, which is basically your study that has some sort of uh, design to it. You know, you have treatment arms, you have a placebo, you have, you know, you have an intervention group, you have randomization, you have people who assign to various arms and they have various things happen to them in those arms. And so the trials management system keeps track of the various documents you have, like consent forms and IRB reviews, and it also keeps track of who's in the um, who's in the study, and uh, when they sign the consent, it captures that information. It gives you eligibility criteria and so on to enroll people into studies. Then you can set up your study to define things like the order sets, the procedures, and various uh, tests that are going to be done throughout the course of the study, the case report forms, and also very important, the financial aspects of it, which is something REDCap doesn't, doesn't handle. So that it'll keep track of what things are you doing in the study and who's going to pay for them. Sometimes the things are covered by the study, a special lab test, a special drug, but other times the things that are done in the study are part of routine care and they actually get billed to the insurance company, and so it has to be sort of forked to the, to the right financial system. And then it, uh, it will keep track of the visits, who's getting what data captured, and you can see uh, who's missing data, who hasn't had a procedure done, that sort of thing. And then it can report out study management data and the financial data out to uh, the, the people that need that. And these are just, again, some screenshots, a case report form. Uh, and uh, so the process is you go into Encore to define your study, and then that talks to Power Trials, which is in the Cerner or Impact system. And so it sends information about the trial to Power Trials, and then you can start to register people in the clinical information system through Power Trials, and um, then that information about them, about the registry becomes available to physicians who are seeing the patient, know then that the patient is enrolled in the study, and you can start bringing in power planes, which are fancy order sets for, um, for the clinical study. So you can say, okay, here's an order set for the first day of the study, here's an order set for the second day of the study, and so on. Uh, just an example, case report form. So, you know, these all things look alike. They're a bunch of web forms with, with boxes that you fill in. So clinical data warehouses, once you've captured your data, you've managed your study, these data tend to go into places where they can be reused. So clinical data warehouses and a lot of data for, for these clinical data warehouses actually come from electronic health records, which I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but let me just jump into some of the software for clinical data warehouses. So I2B2 uh, is a uh, very popular, and it's, it's nicely capitalized the first I there for me. It should lowercase I, lowercase b. I2B2, Informatics for Integrating Bench to Bedside. Uh, this is a system from Harvard University. It's open source, freely shareable. Uh, again, you, you install it in your own local system, and it provides a database. It provides a query interface, uh, terminologies. And so you put your data into that database and then use it for, for a query and provide some limited analytic capabilities as well. Um, there's a couple of mechanisms for tying these things together so that if, we, if you have multiple instances of I2B2, you can bring them together through a network called Shrine. Uh, I don't remember what Shrine stands for, but it's the I2B2 uh, sort of sanctioned network. And we're in a Shrine network with three other institutions but we're going to probably have a Shrine network with Children's Hospital when they set up their, their version of I2B2, and, um, and we, can, we can participate in others uh, as they come along. The other network is the Trinetics network. This is a commercial network. So you guys have already seen I2B2. Uh, this, I think the last week was a lecture on I2B2, right? So you, um, I don't need to show you that. Uh, but remember, you pick terms off the, from the left-hand side, put them into these, these frames here run your query, get your summary data, and then you can get detailed data afterwards. And there's some analytic, um, nice analytics for that. So I2B2 data, just to recap, if, the, if Matt didn't tell you, we have uh, data on um, uh, almost a million patients, 883,000 patients, 10 million visits, and so on. And most of the data, a big chunk is labs. Uh, this is often the case in, uh, in these systems and medications. Um, and then we're working diligently to bring more data over from I2B2, uh, from uh, Cerner into, the, uh, into I2B2 and also data from Cancer Registry. And we'll be bringing data from other systems I'll talk about a little later in this talk. Okay, so we've got Impact or Cerner, 
and that provides data to the UAB Enterprise Clinical Data Warehouse, which is called uh, Power Insight. Everything's power something with Cerner. So there's uh, Power Insight, and that's a commercial product that is accessed by analysts. So a researcher goes to an analyst and says, I need these data, gets the data out of the warehouse. But, um, and then you can use that for figuring out who it is you want to enroll in your study. You can get data sets uh, for, uh, for analysis if you want to analyze those, and you can also uh, just go in there and say, how many patients do we have at UAB that have this disease and have never been on this medication because I want to try enrolling them in my study or whatever your enrollment criteria are. But if you want to do self-service, then you go to I2B2, which has a subset of those data, and we're increasing that subset as we go along, and you'll, uh, the a researcher then goes to that self-service. And again, the idea is you could go and get summary data, and I don't, I don't know how much uh, Matt talked about this, but probably doesn't hurt to, to repeat it. When you get to summary data, you can use that for your cohort feasibility. How many people have this disease that did not get this medication? We can, you can use that as a, as a sort of get a ballpark figure of how many people are available for studying. Um, then you can get detailed data in de-identified form, which you can use for data analysis uh, in and of itself. So you could say, well, people who have this disease that got this drug, how many got you know, renal failure? And you can follow, follow them through the data that we have available. And then finally, you can get additional data that can be in identified form, which could be used for figuring out who is it that actually is eligible for my study. So I can contact them, write, write to them or call them, uh, email them, whatever, so I can enroll them in the study. Uh, and if once they're in the study, you can actually get identifiable data uh, to support the work that you're doing in your study. So that's um, I2B2, our I2B2. And then uh, uh, the data from all these other systems is going to flow into I2B2 down the road. So Encore has case report forms, and those are going to go into impact, and they will flow down into the warehouse and into I2B2, so you'll be able to get at those data uh, through a variety of ways. Uh, we have our instance of REDCap, and that will be providing data to the, both the warehouse where appropriate and to um, I2B2. Some people may not want their data to go into the warehouse because it's their own research data, and they're not, they don't want it make it generally available, but they can put it into I2B2 where it'll be easier to get at than it would be with REDCap, and it'll also be integrated with all the other data about the research subjects, which REDCap does not have. And then PRO, also Patient Reported Outcome System. Likewise, we'll be able to put data into impact if it's appropriate, if it's clinically relevant, and then it'll flow down through the warehouse and into I2B2. So I mentioned Shrine, and the other one is Trinetics. Uh, I don't have a picture of Shrine because it looks like I2B2. It's an I2B2 interface that queries multiple sites. But Trinetics is a little different. So Trinetics is a company that was uh, financed by the pharmaceutical industry to connect uh, I2B2 instances together to allow the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical par participants, to find which institutions are likely uh, to be successful at recruiting patients for their studies. So they can go in there and say, oh, we want to try a new drug. Here are the enrollment criteria. How many people are at UAB that fit that enrollment? How many people are at, you know, at Vanderbilt? How many people at Emory? And so on. And then they can get back a summary. They can't use the data for research, uh, but then they can use the data to, to motivate them to come down to Birmingham and say, hey, we want to do a study. Here's a $10 million. Will you do this study for us? So it's kind of a win-win for them, a win-win for, you know, win for us. But also, we can use Trinetics to actually query for summary data from other sites that are participating with us, and we can use the data for research. Now, they're just summary data, but you can still use summary data for looking at populations, looking at trends, that kind of thing. And we currently have an agreement that is this close to being in place with um, University of Kentucky. There's, Trinetics came back and said, oh, I need one more signature, so I have to get one more signature. And then we will be able to go into Trinetics. It looks like this, you log in, um, you register user ID and password, you log in, and then this is, here's some query I did for people with diabetes on insulin and loop diuretics, and uh, I found, and, and this is going against our own database right now, 15,000 patients. And again, nice analytics and, and uh, visualization tools. Here is kind of showing me how the patient populations have been narrowed down as I add more filters to my, to my query. So that's clinical data warehouses. Now tightly con connected to that is electronic health records. Now electronic health records provide data for um, warehouses and clinical trials management systems because they are, can be used actually as a primary research data capture method. So here, for instance, if somebody comes in and they're in a study and they're going to get a lab test done, if it's a standard lab test, you know, it's a diabetic, we're studying their blood sugar, it gets done in the lab. It gets ordered in the EHR and done in the lab, and the results end up in the electronic health record. Uh, you could also create data entry forms 
uh, that uh, structured data entry forms that the clinician could complete uh, as part of the study that ask, you know, okay, what's going on with the patient today? How much pain do they have? And you could actually create that in right in the EHR and save that step of having to transfer from REDCap out to some other system if, that, if it would have made sense to do that. So you can use the EHR for primary data capture and it does some things fairly well. Uh, but a lot of people like to use it for secondary purposes because it's got all these data in there and can we now take those data and look at and ask other questions of those data, whether they're patients on clinical trials who we want to kind of go reanalyze the data or they're patients who are just getting routine care and uh, we say, you know, half the patients in the world get this drug for diabetes and have them get that drug. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, so let's pull up some populations and, you know, get case controls and, and see who's doing or match cases and see who's doing better. Um, so why do we want to do this? Well, it's the data is captured by clinicians and instruments that are, you know, high quality, we hope. The instruments hopefully high quality. The clinicians are trained at capturing clinical data, and so uh, these should be high quality data. It's got data about the phenome, okay, the data about what that person's really like. Do they smoke? What do they look like? How much do they weigh? Uh, where do they work? It's got a lot of information about the patient that is not maybe typically captured in a, in a, um, in a clinical study and certainly not captured when studies that are like genetic studies where you're just collecting a blood sample and learning uh, sequence analysis. Um, the, these are becoming universally available. Uh, there are still places that do not have electronic health records, but they're they're dwindling because of the reimbursement um, plans for uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and third-party payers that will be reimbursing less to those institutions that do not have electronic health records. So they're becoming financially uh, feasible. The data are almost free. So the data are in there, and once you set up a pipeline, you can kind of run that pipeline for almost nothing, and you can get those data. Uh, and it's certainly a lot cheaper than going out and saying, hey, see all those diabetics, let's run a blood test on all of them. If it's something that's done routinely, you can get that without having to go through the expense of the blood test. And you can do some interesting things like post-marketing surveillance or phase four studies. We can say, all right, here's a drug that's been brought out to the, to, the, uh, to the public. Let's see what happens now in a population that's getting this. And phase four studies will often discover... Uh, unfortunately, severe side effects of a drug that weren't found in smaller third, uh, phase three and phase two clinical trials. Uh, and um, so post-marketing surveillance is very important. You have to know what you're looking for. You can't just go, show me all the adverse effects that happened to the people on this drug. But if you have things that you're suspicious of, you can then go in and say, find any people on this drug that had this outcome, people that not on this drug that had this outcome. Let's look and see what the, what the rates are. Um, you can use it to validate research studies. So if you say in a research study, I think this drug improves this measurable thing in a disease by 20%, you can then go and see, well, what happens when we apply it out in the community? What's the, what percentage of improvement, if any, are we seeing? And you can even do it, use it to replicate research studies, whereby you can kind of find these uh, control, you know, sort of natural controls, people that didn't get a drug, people that are getting a drug, match them based on various criteria and uh, replicate the research study. But you have to understand where these data come from. There are a lot of limitations, uh, and it's critical to understand those limitations before you can apply them in, in uh, research. Uh, so there's a, a, a paper on a system at NIH. I just want to show a quick case study. It's a system called Beatrice, and it's like I2B2, in effect, it pulls data out of the electronic health record. You can go in, self-service queries, and I'm going to just show you a quick query from that. This is the user interface, and I was very curious about um, people that had um, elevated B12 levels, and what happens when somebody, has, uh, somebody shows up with an elevated B12 level but seems otherwise healthy and isn't taking B12 and isn't on a weird diet or anything like that. Um, I wasn't curious about why their B12 was high. I was curious about whether there were diseases that they might have that would be occult because there are certain diseases where B12 goes up. They're usually pretty bad diseases, and by the time you get really, by the time the B12 goes up, you're sick enough that people realize that you have something. But what about somebody who's otherwise healthy? So I thought, well, that should be easy. I said, all right, find me all the people with elevated B12. Uh, if you can't read, I just put in B12, and it, uh, let's see, it finally here, it found a lab test, vitamin B12, intravascular test, and I said numeric range greater than 999, and, uh, and it found uh, 5,834 patients. And I said, great, now get me all their diagnoses, get me all their B12 levels, and let me see what kind of diagnoses are correlating so that these people, maybe they had a normal B12, and then they developed a disease, and then their B12 went up, or maybe they had the B12 went up before they had the disease and later got it, so I could look for the correlations. 
And I was able to download a spreadsheet, look something like this, and just pop it into Microsoft Excel and play around with it. And I was able to do things like this to say, okay, find me the, you know, knowing what the, the rate of an individual disease was in the database, find me patients that, what, what diseases were appearing in my database more frequently than expected. So red is the actual, blue is the expected, and you can see this this third one down, really high. Unfortunately, it's lymphoproliferative disorder, not elsewhere classified. So it's an ICD-9 code that's very nonspecific, and it certainly includes a number of diseases that are already well known to cause B12 elevation. Uh, so it's kind of a large bucket. So that was a little disturbing, but um, a number of other things there as well that maybe weren't like splenomegaly or hepatitis that aren't specifically linked to that. And so I popped them in this, this piece of software. It's called... Um, uh, Lifelines 2, it's from the University of Maryland, and uh, also free software for visualization of data. And the patients with the normal B12s are, when there's a normal B12, there's a, a green diamond. When B12 is high, there's a yellow diamond. And then the various diseases are scattered around. And in this case, I said, fine, line everybody up on their first instance of lymphoproliferative disorder, not elsewhere classified, and let me see what other diseases are appearing or when the B12 is there and so on. Um, long story short, it was a very pretty graph, and, and, but the data were pretty much worthless. I was not able to find any kind of correlation, and part of the reason was that the diseases are not uh, recorded consistently uh, because the, uh, so you'll see, oh, this patient has this disease that isn't the kind of disease that goes away. Like they have diabetes, and then next time they don't have diabetes, then they do have diabetes, then they don't have diabetes. So the diabetes wasn't coming and going, it was the documentation that was coming and going. Now why was that the case? This is where you have to understand where the data are coming from. These are data used for recording the, the, reason, for the, um, the reason for the admission. Right? So if the patient came in for something other than that, that primary problem, was in for some other thing, they may not bother to record that other diagnosis. So you can't use that as a longitudinal record of what's really going on. It's not the same as an active problem list. So that's just one example of the the kinds of problems that we'd see with these EHR data. Now, there's a paper by Hirsch uh, and a bunch of other folks, including me, that looked at um, these kinds of problems that arise with electronic health record data. And uh, this is one of the readings that, uh, that you'll have. And uh, let me just see where I am with time. Oh, good. OK. I can slow down a little. So I'll have time to go through these. So some caveats for the use of electronic health record data in research where you think, oh, it's free, it's easy to get, all I have to do is pop it in a spreadsheet, stick it in a closet with a graduate student for six months, and I'll get a, you know, get a really nice paper out of it. What was that beeping noise? Hopefully that was somebody. Oh, somebody whose microphone's not on mute. Okay. All right. So the caveats. Well, let me stop there for a second. Since this, I'm going to dive into this a little bit. Questions so far? Questions about the systems I went through? Questions about EHR data? No questions. If there's a question online and you have a microphone, you can unmute. You can try that. Okay. You might try to just put you in the bottom there and see if the chat is open. Open the chat window. Nope. Nothing in the chat window. I mean, nothing new. Okay. All right. So the caveats. Okay, so first of all, EHRs can contain inaccurate data. So while we hope that the data in the patient's uh, record are correct, they may be inaccurate. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for these, and you know we don't have time to go into all of them. But for instance, sometimes people will copy things. You know, somebody will say something in a record, and it will just persist uh, in the record over and over. People will copy it over and over. So for example, uh, the undiagnosed disease program at NIH, um, there was a patient who came in who had all these strange neurologic complaints and had an episode of hyperkalemia, elevated potassium. Uh, so people are initially are thinking this is a periodic hyperkalemia syndrome, a familial disease that does have some unusual uh, neurologic problems, but this patient had some really bizarre ones that didn't fit, and so they were really searching and searching and searching, and uh, in the end, it turned out that it was all psychogenic, uh, that this patient had some severe psychiatric problems, and in fact never had hyperkalemia, um, there had been one episode where when they, when they went back and looked where the potassium was a little elevated and the specimen was hemolyzed, so the patient never actually had hyperkalemia, but it got copied over and made part of her permanent record. Um, or you may have somebody who's misdiagnosed. Uh, so there was a, I saw a case in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago, a patient with, you know, who they thought had 
um, uh, sarcoidosis. And so they were, oh, this is a really weird case of sarcoidosis, and they're trying different drugs, and nothing's working. And for years, this patient is being treated for sarcoidosis, and then finally they said, oh, no, it's tuberculosis. And so uh, yeah, great for that patient. They cured her tuberculosis. But her record, if you went back and looked at her record, they didn't go back and correct the record and say, you know, uh, sarcoidosis, but really it's tuberculosis. They didn't go back and correct that. You would have to go through the whole record to find that out. So if you use the early part of the record, it would all say uh, sarcoidosis. So lots of errors can creep into the record and uh, be hard to eradicate. They often don't tell the complete story. Uh, so they don't tell you, for instance, my example, they don't have the complete problem list. But also patients get their care in multiple places. They get care done in the inpatient side, the outpatient side. Patients here may come in here uh, and be hospitalized, but they may go to their private physician's office when they're not here, and we have no record of what happens there unless they tell us uh, when they come in, oh, last week I was at my doctor and he did this, did that. Those data are often incomplete, and even when we have them, they're in text form and hard to get at. So we don't get the labs they had that were done somewhere else. We don't have the problem list. We don't have the medications in a, in a, in a complete way. Uh, a lot of times data are transformed or coded for some purpose other than research and clinical care. So my lymphoproliferative disorder not otherwise specified or not elsewhere classified as an example of that. Those people didn't come in and say, well, what seems to be the problem, ma'am? Well, I have this lymphoproliferative disorder that's not otherwise specified, uh, you know, or not elsewhere classified. So, no, they came in with, you know, some sort of weird lymphoma and some coding was like couldn't find the weird lymphoma and said, well, it must be one of these lymphoproliferative disorders that's not listed somewhere else, so I'll use this code. And that's the, where these uh, data come from. And so they were recorded for a billing purpose or for a, a, you know, a, a reporting purpose that wasn't related to research or patient care. So you end up trying to use these data that were, you know, you're trying to use apples for when you're trying to make orange juice. It doesn't work too well sometimes. Um, data, a lot of data captured in, in clinical notes, a text form. And so they may not be recoverable in an easy way. We can use natural language processing. Uh, maybe we're going to get better at that and uh, be able to pull more data out of the record. But um, for now, it's, a, it's a, a tough place to find the data. And a lot of times in those notes, it's not completely recorded because of the, the uh, just the sheer workload of trying to record everything in the notes. Um, we get multiple sources of data. So patients tell us stuff. Doctors tell us stuff. Medical students tell us stuff. Nurses telling stuff. All that stuff goes into the record. Uh, we get data from different kinds of laboratories uh, that all go into the record, and they're not all comparable with each other. And so you have to understand where those data came from to really understand how to uh, interpret them. Um, and the data granularity in the electronic health record is the granularity needed for patient care and may not match the needs for your uh, research study. So for example, a typical example is pain. So um, when I see a patient uh, for pain, I'm really curious about, do you have pain today? Is it better or worse than last time you were here? You know, how much better, how much worse? Uh, but in a research study, they might have a 20-point scale and say, you know, we want you to use this 20-point scale because it's part of our standard way that we measure pain in this disease. And we're going to ask you about 20 different parts of your body. And we've got to collect it in all those different parts and record that. And the research study needs that, but in the electronic health record, we don't have time to do that stuff. So we go, how's the pain? Where is it worst? Oh, your elbow? OK, right elbow, left elbow. I forgot to write that down. Doesn't matter. We're trying to make it better. Doesn't matter where it is. We're going to give you more medicine and see if we can get rid of that pain. And so uh, you get this granularity problem uh, mismatch between EHRs and, and research. And then um, when you have patients who are on research protocols, the way that you collect the data from them is going to be different than the way you would collect it in clinical care. You, in clinical care, you might do a blood test once a month, whereas in, in a pro protocol, you might do it once a day. You might collect, be collecting blood pressures every half hour for six hours during a research protocol, which you wouldn't do uh, just in routine care unless somebody was having an acute problem with their blood pressure. Uh, so there's a, and we may use different medications and we may actually violate standard practice when we're doing a research protocol because the purpose of the research protocol is to figure out if there's a better practice. And so we may do things differently in that protocol. We may not treat uh, a fever when we, when we would otherwise treat a fever and that sort of thing. So those are all some of the major, major ones and the, uh, the article goes into more detail on these. Okay, so we didn't just leave everybody hanging uh, with, uh, you know, okay, here's what's wrong with the EHRs. We actually tried to develop a roadmap uh, for this, uh, and now it's published in a second paper. Both of these are available on PubMed, um, and I did not put this one in the readings. It's a little bit more, a little bit harder to, uh, harder to get, but you could 
you could go after this one if you wanted as well. The basic idea, uh, and it's a little bit far-fetched, the basic idea was to emulate the uh, data collection process that's used in a systematic review. So when you're trying to find the best evidence, clinical evidence for a decision, you go into the medical literature and you look for things like randomized clinical trials, and you find those and you bring the data together in certain ways. And there are a bunch of practices that you use for doing, uh, for determining the best evidence from clinical literature. And this paper argues that you should use the same approach when you're pulling data from an electronic health record. Get the best data that you can uh, and the way that you merge it and so on. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting approach. A lot of the, and then we go on to say, okay, we're not there yet. We can't do that. Why not? Well, because we don't have enough data uh, metadata about our data, so we don't know how data were collected. Uh, and so the, we, we argue for better uh, metadata about the data in the electronic health record, and then we argue for a research agenda that uh, sort of the uh, Informatician uh, Employment Act, I guess, uh, you know, trying to get good job security for the informaticians, because we've got to do some research to discover what these methods are and to improve those methods. Uh, and so there's a whole, as I say, a whole roadmap laid out to, to do that. Okay, so that's systems and records. I think next is standards. Yeah, so before I go on, whoops, questions. All right, and I'm right almost halfway point. Good. So standards. So I'm going to talk about standard terminologies, and then I'll talk about some stand, data standard, data interchange standards. So standard terminologies, lots of terminologies in healthcare. Uh, the Unified Medical Language System has two, something like 215 languages in it now. Uh, so these are, and you know, that's just counting English. Uh, all these, um, and this is an old UMLS photo just showing some of the paper versions of these terminologies. Uh, there are a number of uh, terminologies that are, that are sort of used uh, reliably in healthcare in, uh, in clinical research. I'm only going to go into some of them, um, but allow me to go into a little bit of detail with those. Uh, so, International Classification of Diseases, with Modifications 9 and 10, there's the NDC codes, there's RxNorm, there's LOINC, uh, and then SNOMED, and whoop, that's it. And so those are, those are the main ones that are used in clinical research where you're dealing with electronic health records. Okay, so these are terminologies that are typically used to capture data in patient health records. There are lots of other terminologies that are used in, uh, in clinical research and just not time to cover those. But um, these are the main ones that you'll encounter if you're using electronic health record data. So international classification of diseases. Um, we have some clinician, you're a clinician, so you know about ICD. So ICD, international classification diseases, without anything after it, just ICD is maintained by the World Health Organization. And it's, uh, I mean, it started over 100 years ago. The World Health Organization came about, I think, 1950 or so after the, after the, uh, uh, the United Nations was formed. And um, they've been maintaining it since ICD-6 or 7, and all the way up to um, ICD-10. And, and, uh, but we have these modifications. So there's a strict hierarchy of terms. It's causes of death uh, and lots of other, they throw in other diseases. So there's like poison ivy with not a common cause of death. There's a lot of other things in there now as well. But mostly it was created for, for reporting causes of death to the World Health Organization. It's got some peculiar terms like things that say not otherwise specified, which just means sort of a generic. So if you say, well, you got this pneumonia, that pneumonia, and you could have pneumonia not otherwise specified, meaning we didn't say what kind of pneumonia it was. And then there's this not elsewhere classified. So there are things like this lymphoproliferative disorder not elsewhere classified just means, well, there was no code anywhere else, so I'm going to just use this, this sort of garbage can code. It kind of means other. Um, and it's been extended in the U.S. and in other countries uh, with these clinical modifications. So, for example, ICD-9 was the ninth version of ICD extended with clinical modifications, so ICD-9-CM, which is what we've been using since 1979 in this country uh, for um, capturing uh, causes of uh, reasons for admission to the hospital. Uh, so, I, 1979, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services took ICD, which had about 14,000 uh, or sorry, 8,000 terms, and added another layer of about 6,000 terms, six, uh, yeah, 6,000 terms, added another layer to the hierarchy, just another layer of specificity, because they thought, oh, this will give us enough detail for clinical care. Um, that's, uh, in that, and we've been using that for years and years and years. ICD-10 came out in 1982, uh, but we didn't get around to ICD-10-CM until 2015, so last year. Uh, that has 
155,000 terms. So they've you know, gone another order of magnitude larger, and they said, now we have enough terms. But of course, people are still using it and not, they're finding a lot of nonsense terms. I have a great poster in my office of like, you know, uh, causes of death an injury due to like, uh, uh, what was it, injury from shark other than bite. Okay, so you could be injured by a shark in some way that's other being, otherwise being bitten by the shark. Uh, injury in an opera house. Uh, you know, just all kinds of crazy things. They wanted to really be clear, but nevertheless, people are finding things that they can't say in ICD-10. Um, okay, and ICD-11 is in development, so we'll see what happens, how long we're stuck with ICD-10. ICD-11 has some, some interesting um, uh, uh, features to it that uh, I guess I already gave my terminology lecture. Uh, but ICD-9, ICD-10 have these con problems of things like strict hierarchies, and, uh, and ICD-11 uh, breaks past that and actually uh, overcomes some of the limitations. Okay, so here's some examples, hard to read, that these are all the tuberculosis codes in ICD-10-CM that go range from the code A15 through code A19.9. Um, so I don't know what that is, about 50 or 60 codes. There used to be something like 470 codes for tuberculosis in ICD-9 CM. Uh, they really went into all kinds of detail about how the test was, how the diagnosis was made. Was it made on histology or culture or all these other things? Now they're paying attention to where it occurs in the body. So it's very interesting. There's much more detail that's much more clinically relevant. The upside of this is you can now say, what's, does this patient have tuberculous neuritis or tuberculous keratitis? But the downside is you can't compare your data from 2014 to 2016 because it's there's not any way to crosswalk between these things. But the other thing is, that because this thing is a strict hierarchy, you go and say, well, I want to find all the cases of tuberculosis. I'll just look for everything that begins with A15 through A19, and I'll get all my cases. And the problem is that, that there are other ones in there as well. So if you go off and look under B90, you'll find sequela of tuberculosis. So those are people with tuberculosis, too, that have other complications. Or B or O, which I love that they use O, so now you can't tell if it's a zero or an O. O980, tuberculosis complicating pregnancy and childbirth. So these terms are not under the A terms because they're under the childbirth terms. But so you have, and they can't be under both because it's a strict hierarchy. So it's a problem with ICD-11. And then there's a few others scattered around. If you look around, you can find another congenital tuberculosis, pneumoconiosis associated with tuberculosis. So if you want to find all the cases of tuberculosis, you really, you got to pull all these, these codes out. Um, another common terminology, drug terminology, is the national drug codes. And those are the drug codes that are applied to uh, what would they refer to as labeled products. So things that are sold in the U.S. that are regulated by the FDA have a, an NDC code that's provided by the labeler. So the um, the US, uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration does not create the codes. They let the labeler do it. So they give the labeler a, a, a labeler code, a four or five digit code, and then the labeler adds to that code based on what the product is and what the package is. So there's a four or five digit labeler code. There's a two, three or four digit product code that's set by the labeler, and they can do, they can use whatever code they want for their for that chemical and some other co a labeler that has the same co chemical can use a different. Um, product code, and then there's the package code, and again, they can use those package codes however they want, um, and all together, and it produces this, this long code, and I'll show you some examples, but they can reuse the codes. The labelers, if they decide, oh, I don't want to use this code anymore, I'm going to use a, I'm going to have a new product, but I, uh, I need a code for it, I'll use this code that I'm not using anymore, which doesn't mean that the drug doesn't exist anymore. It could still be out there on a shelf, and you could have two drugs on the shelf, very different drugs with the same exact code. So that, of course, is a problem. So here's some examples. Um, this is a uh, is um, nitrostat, nitroglycerin uh, sublingual tablet, 0 0.3 milligrams. And these are a couple of records from the ND, uh, the FDA's database. Um, and it has a unique identifier for this product, 3412. I don't know why they just don't use that as the identifier, but they instead they have the. Let's see, is this a laser pointer? I'm afraid to push a button. One of these buttons will turn it off. All right, let's see. Can you see the mouse? So there's the four-digit labeler code, um, and they have a blank there because it could be five digits. There's the four-digit product code. Could have been a three-digit code. And then here is the two-digit um, package code. So when you put it all together, that's the code. That's the NDC code for that product, at least by that labeler at that moment. 
Now, the problem with this code is, one of the problems is people look at this and go, oh, this is really ugly. Um, let's get rid of the hyphens. That way, my data entry form, I can say, hey, you're only allowed to put digits in. And so I can limit the thing, and, and that way, um, you know, then you put it in like that. The problem is, when you put it in like that, you don't know where the hyphens go. So it could have been hyphenated either of those two ways. And there are actually cases of that where there, where there are codes that are different because there's a four-digit labeler code and a five-digit labeler code with a three-digit product code. So it's the same length, it's just uh, parsed differently. What's worse is people go, oh, we're going to do data entry, we're only going to allow numbers, integers, right? That's a nice way to do your data checking. So you, you get rid of those, those nasty zeros in the beginning, now you've got an integer. So your data entry thing can check it. The problem is now you've got all these different ways that you can parse that code. And so uh, these, this does cause trouble at times. They've tried to get away from the NDC codes, uh, and the reason that they can't is, uh, one of the big reasons is that it would require everybody to buy new barcode readers. Apparently the barcode readers they use in the pharmacies can't read longer numbers, and so we're kind of stuck with this, with this coding system. Meanwhile, the National Library of Medicine has said, well, this is a ridiculous reason. Let's come up with a better coding scheme, something that's based on the meaning of what these things are, and uh, let's collect all the data from all the labelers that we can. We'll work with um, the uh, with uh, HL7. We'll work with the uh, pharmacy knowledge base vendors, the drug knowledge base vendors, who are the ones that pull together data for your clinical information system. So companies like Multum and Micromedics and First Data Bank. Um, so all these folks got together. It started actually with work that we did in HL7 on this idea of a clinical drug, which is, look, everybody agrees that there's an aspirin 325 milligram tablet. Can't we just have a code for that that everybody agrees on? And yes, there are brands and other things, but we'll worry about that later. Let's just get codes for that level of clinical drug, which is something that has a measurable amount of ingredients and some kind of identifiable delivery form, like tablet or capsule, that kind of thing. So that was clinical drug, and the NLM took that, ran with it, and uh, developed RxNorm. So RxNorm has codes, and these are all in the UMLS, Unified Medical Language System, that look like this. So this is diazepam, 5 milligram oral capsule, and this is actually the Valium. So this is a brand, uh, brand name of diazepam, 5 milligram uh, capsule. It turns out that there's, uh, so that's the clinical drug, diazepam, 5 milligram oral capsule, and it turns out they're actually there's a, a Solus. I never knew this until I looked up Valium. It turns out that Solus is another brand name for the same thing as Valium. And that's, so that's another brand name. And they have this relationship, trade name uh, relationship with um, the, uh, the clinical drug. And then there are other kinds of ways of classifying this thing. Uh, so diazepam oral capsule, Valium oral capsule, so on. What they don't have is they don't have a hierarchy of the uh, uses of the drug. So they don't have that this is a, a tranquilizer. For instance, and RX Norm doesn't have that classification seen, so that's a that's kind of a downside. But it has other things. It's got you know the brand name ingredients. It's got uh, this notion of diazepam five milligrams, which is kind of like an, uh, an ingredient and a strength come together, and then that's linked to diazepam, which is the chemical, and it's got oral capsule as a form. So there's this whole semantic network uh, of the uh, meanings of these terms in RX Norm, which is kind of kind of useful for a lot of different things. But the important thing is it's very complete. Uh, and the, pretty much all the drugs that we deal with in, in the hospital and the formulary can be mapped to these, to these RX norm codes, which is now a national standard. Uh, LOINC, another national standard, stands for Logical Objects, Identifiers, Names, and Codes. It was originally created for lab tests for HL7 messages. I'll talk about HL7 in a little bit. But HL7 messages had this one field for the name of the lab test. And again, people got together and said, look, we all measure sodium in the serum. Why can't we just have a code for that? And uh, so the bunch of people that were working on this problem said, OK, but let's do it with something that actually represents the meaning of the terms in a, in a semantic way. So they came up with this self, these things, of, these self-defining names for the lab test that actually tell you what the test uh, is, is about. So here's some. I'll give you some more uh, some examples, but there are six pieces to these names. The first one's called the component, and they put in some other stuff, subspecies and challenge and other stuff. But basically, the component is the analyte. That's the thing the test measures. And then there's the property, which is the mass or the concentration or time or uh, activity, whatever the test is actually measuring of that analyte. Uh, there's a timing uh, part, and that could be it could say whether it's a point in time, like a blood test, where you take the blood out. And, two in the morning, whatever it is, or 24 hours, 24 hour urine collection, whatever the period of time that, uh, that you collected the specimen. And then speaking of specimen, they call it a system. 
Uh, so, but it's really the specimen, and it could be blood or urine or swimming pool water or cafeteria food, uh, whatever it is. And then there's scale, which tells you the precision. Is it is it quantitative? Is it a number? Is it qualitative, where it's sort of uh, maybe plus one, plus two, semi-quantitative? Is it a color? Uh, that kind of thing. So there's different kinds of precision. Most lab tests are numbers, uh, but not all of them, or, or uh, quantitative, but not all of them. And then sometimes they add in method. So sometimes the way the test is done will affect sort of its clinical relevance. So the, the typical example is uh, finger stick blood sugar. So most blood sugar tests, glucose tests, it doesn't say how it's measured, but if it was a finger stick, then, then that's measured because it's known to be a less accurate uh, test. So just some examples. Uh, the, every LOINC uh, term has a, a unique identifier, which is an integer uh, and a hyphen and a check digit. And it uses, if you know what mod 11 is, it's uh, this, this check digit calculation called mod 11, which is not the same as the mathematical function mod 11. But it's a calculation that gives you a unique uh, digit for this sequence of in integers. And if there was a transposition or a, an incorrect number, uh, it would give you a different check digit. If there are two mistakes, if you transpose and make an incorrect one, it might still give you uh, a different check digit, but might not. But it'll at least catch transpositions and um, single single errors. And these are some examples. Let's you go to the mouse again. So here's a glucose test, and this one has an intervention, three-hour post, 100-gram glucose. So this is a glucose challenge test where they, they measure glucose, but they give you a big slug of glucose to drink before the test. Uh, it's SCNC, stands for substance concentration. So that's uh, uh, millimoles per deciliter. It's a point in time. It's measured in serum or plasma and is a quantitative test. And then here's the same test, except that the result is reported in milligrams per, uh, sorry, this was milli, milli, um, millimoles per liter, and this is milligrams per deciliter, so mass concentration. Um, but it's um, otherwise the same test, but has a different code and different check digit. Here's a coagulation test, and this is measuring um, this is a, the PPP control, so it's, the, it's a, in a patient. The uh, specimen is the patient, and it's quantitative, and then it mentions the method, which is a tilt-tube method for doing it, uh, and so on. Here's a calculation. Uh, here's one where they put in a, an extra creatine, creatine kinase dot MB, which is a, a subspecies uh, of creatine kinase. So lots of different ways to express this. It turns out that when you go to different laboratories and say, okay, figure out what loin codes to give to your tests, they're pretty good at figuring out which one of these things matches the test they have. There's still a few things that are a little, little flaky, but generally pretty good. So now we have a standard for laboratory as well as medications. And, the, um, and those are two of the big hitters in, in electronic health records. Now getting people to adopt these is, is another story. Uh, the laboratory, local laboratories typically won't bother with loin codes because they don't have a need to do that. They're only reporting it to their own EHR and they leave it up to the EHR to figure out what to do with it. But if you go to some place like MedPath or one of those other, one of these commercial labs, they will report their, the data with uh, loin codes. Uh, okay, next uh, and last I think is SNOMED CT. So SNOMED CT is a terminology that covers uh, a wide variety of, of terms in medicine. It started out as a systematized nomenclature of diseases and organisms, SNDO, New York Academy of Medicine, 1928. Uh, New York Academy of Medicine didn't maintain it, uh, and the College of American Pathologists picked it up, and they added to it, and they called it the systematized nomenclature of pathology, and that was used for a long, long time for classifying uh, pathology slides with these four axes, topography, etiology, morphology, and function. And what they would do is they'd say, okay, what did I see under the slide? Well, I'm looking at a piece of the liver, and I'm seeing bacteria, and I'm seeing inflammation, and I'm seeing obstruction of the bile ducts. And so those were the, the T, E, M, and F, and they would describe the slides that way uh, with the idea that then you could go and say, well, find me all the slides that show, you know, more, you know, inflammation in the liver, and they could go and pull those slides. Well, uh, a guy named Roger Cote figured out, pathologist figured out, if you took those and added a little bit more to it, you could actually take six of those uh, axes and create a seventh axis for disease. So you could say, okay, if I've got these six things, like if I've got fever and I've got um, inflammation and I've got mycobacterium tuberculosis and I've got the lung and a couple other things, I've got pulmonary tuberculosis. And so he said, let's add a disease classification to this, and then we can match these things. And it was, a, it was an interesting idea. Um, 
it had trouble getting traction. Uh, it was very expensive to do. It was they didn't use computers to do this. It was all done on paper, and it was all done in the mind of, of uh, Roger Cote. So had a lot of inconsistencies, and it was very messy. Um, but eventually, the College of American Pathologists said, "Let's put a little money money into this. Let's get some ontologists to work on this, and let's build it into something that could be really used as a reference terminology for medicine, and could." possibly code everything in healthcare. Now that sounds like very altruistic, but they were actually looking at the AMA that has the CPT codes. And the AMA licenses CPT codes, so if you want to get reimbursed for a procedure, you got to have a license to use CPT codes so you can get reimbursed. The AMA makes half its money on CPT codes. So the College of American Pathology said, ooh, we could make some money on SNOMED. So they created this reference terminology with the idea that it was going to become a money maker for them. Um, and it turned out it made some money, but it really was very expensive to do it right. Uh, they merged with the read codes to increase the content of it, and that became SNOMED CT for SNOMED clinical terms, for the read clinical terms. And then they eventually handed the whole thing off to um, the international, where is it here? The International Health Terminology Standards Development Organization, which is in Denmark. Uh, they handed it off to them and uh, for some money, and the um, and then they license it to different countries. And so we in the U.S. have a site license, a, site, a U.S.-wide site license to use SNOMED uh, for any application we want. And it is a very rich uh, terminology. It covers, very well covers diseases um, and uh, body parts, causes of diseases, organisms. Um, it does pretty well with the chemicals used in medications, but does not cover medication products very well. And it doesn't cover laboratory tests very well. So they've been trying to coordinate with LOINC and RxNorm so that it's sort of the combination of LOINC, RxNorm, and SNOMED would give you really good coverage of um, the terms in clinical medicine. I'll show you some examples. Uh, pulmonary, pulmonary tularemia um, is in a, a multiple hierarchy. So it is a tularemia and it is a bacterial pneumonia. Um, and it has things like finding sites, so lung structure, and it has associated morphology, inflammation, and it's got a causative agent, Francisella tularensis. And a lot of this came from SNOMED 2, uh, the original, the, before they got into the, uh, the SNOMED RT. Um, but it's really, if you think, look at it, it's kind of a formal definition of pulmonary tularemia. It tells you that it's, it is in this two classes, and it has this site, and this morphology, and this cause. And taken together, that kind of defines the concept of pulmonary tularemia. Now, it doesn't tell you how to treat it. Um, but that's not part of the definition of the disease usually. It's usually the things like causes and location. And uh, this is the NCI term browser. And you can go there. Where's my URL? Whoops. I've got a URL for this. And this is a freely available term browser. And it's got all, lots of different terminologies in there if you can. So let me go through them. Uh, here's HL7. Oh, we haven't talked about HL7 yet. ICD-10, ICD-9, LOINC. Um, do, 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 where's, uh, there's SNOMED. Um, uh, Rx norm is in there somewhere, probably off the screen. And then lots of, and you can see there's lots of other terminologies here. So the CTCAE, the common, er, common terminology criteria for adverse events. So that's a terminology typically used in uh, drug research. Uh, let's see, we've got the gene ontology, a terminology used for representing genetic data. MEDRA, the medical uh, dictionary for regulatory activities terminology, which is another uh, terminology used for re recording um, adverse events that occur in uh, drug uh, research and so on. So as you can see, way way more than I could cover in, in an hour lecture. Speaking of which, three, I've got five minutes. Okay, so let me go now to standards for data representation and exchange, the last piece of this. So we've got, I'm going to talk briefly HL7, uh, CDISC, uh, the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, and the NIH Common Data Elements. So HL7 is an organization that started out by creating a messaging standard, so a way to send messages between clinical information systems. Um, and they have version 2. It's a very popular standard, very easy to use. It's got some limitations. They created a reference information model for medicine, and they then based a new messaging standard on this more comprehensive model called version 3. It is very comprehensive. It's very unwieldy, and uh, as a result, it is um, uh, not widely adopted. So we use, version, we use version 2 here. And version 2 was, I think, invented, was developed in like 1988. So it you know, goes, goes way back. Um, they're now working to develop a new standard called FIRE. I don't think I got it on my list here because it wasn't on their website, interestingly. But FIRE is a new, uh, new standard that they're developing that is a subset of version 3 that's in the format of version 2, the easy-to-use format 
and uh, that's getting some traction. They have something called context management specifications, CCAL, uh, and it's for integrating applications at the point of use. The main thing people use CCAL for is single sign-on. So you can go and sign on to one application and it will communicate your login and credentials to other applications so you don't have to sign on every time you go to a different application. Uh, it's got the common the clinical data architecture, which is a markup language for the structure and semantics of clinical documents. And then they've developed the continuity of care document that took another standard called the continuity of care record and turned it into a CDA. So it's CDR plus CDA equals CCD. And the idea was to create a standard single clinical care document that summarizes a patient's medical record that you could then take it out and send it to anybody and with, the, with the idea that they could incorporate it into their own system and kind of pick up where you left off with the patient care. Uh, and then they have this uh, structured product labeling that they're using for uh, the semantics and structure of published medi medication information. So taking the, the, the medication insert and turning it into a structured document. Um, Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, although it sounds very general, is actually a standard that's intended for use in, in clinical research. So they've got standards for laboratory data, standards for representing information about protocols, standards for representing uh, the demographics of patients who are in protocols, and this is just a screenshot from their, from their website. They've got lots of other, lots of other standards there. Uh, and that's finding some traction as well in, in, uh, in uh, developing standards for reporting to the FDA. Uh, and then the last thing I want to mention is the NIH common data elements. The NIH institutes, as you know, fund research in various diseases, and they would like to be able to pull the data together that are collected in the research of any particular disease. So, the, the, uh, so for instance, uh, NHLBI who wants to study heart attacks. They say, okay, everybody that's studying myocardial infarction has to capture certain data elements about the patients. And then we could pull the data from all those studies and bring them together. And they have different levels of standards. They're sort of, all right, anybody gets NHLBI data, research has to collect this set. And then if you're working on this disease, you need this set and this disease, that set, and so on. And so, there, so there's uh, 17 different centers, that I think, that are contributing these, um, these standards. Uh, and it sounds like a great idea. It, it's not just a terminology. It's actually a set of standards for how you measure these things. So if you want to say, okay, we're going to measure blood pressure, that's a common data element, it tells you exactly how you've got to measure that blood. Well, it has to be sitting, they have to be resting for five minutes, it's got to be in the left arm unless they don't have a left arm, you know, and so on and so forth. They've got all these criteria for how to collect the data so that people will collect data that's actually uh, comparable to each other when they pull it together. Uh, sounds like a great idea. Um, but they've got some problems. There's a lot of overlap in the domain. So uh, when I was working on this at NIH, they, they said, well, let's see if we can reconcile these things. And that's when I said, I'm going to leave NIH and go to UAB so I don't have to do this. Um, so here's one. I, I just looked at gender, and smoking is much worse. But gender, you'd think that would be easy, right? A standard way to collect gender information. So the Early, De Early Detection Research Network, I think this is an NIAID project. So they've got female, male, female, and then unknown or refused. And under unknown and refused, there's refused and there's unknown. And then there's another code for missing, meaning, uh, you know, we don't have the data and we don't know why we don't have the data. So that's one. And then consensus measures for phenotypes and exposures, it's a Fenex um, standard that's got male, female, refused, and don't know. And they don't say whether don't know means we couldn't tell when we looked or we don't know because we didn't ask. Uh, and then there's the Global Rare Disease Patient Registry and Data Repository, male, female, other, transsexual and unknown. And so I, I, I don't know what other is exactly. I guess it's whatever it isn't transsexual uh, and isn't male and female. And then there is the, NI, the NINDS has female, male. Uh, notice they change the order. Female, male, unknown, unspecified, and not reported. So these are kind of probably matched to some of these. And there's some mapping. Oh, and then NIE, NEI, National Eye Institute, has eye gene. They've got male, female, and unknown, and that's it. Um, I guess when you look in people's eyes, you can tell you can tell by looking them in the eye what gender they are. So uh, those are the, uh, that's just a simple one. When you get to things like diseases or physical findings, it's kind of all over the place. So they're trying to find ways to reconcile these uh, so that people can then incorporate these into electronic health records as standard ways to capture data that could then be reused for research. All right, so that's my, those are my topics. Um, and I think that's my last slide. So I have a minute for questions maybe. Thank you. My fan club. I brought my fan club. <laughs> two of my trainees and two of my relatives. So, uh, any questions at home? Let me pull up the chat, see if anybody's still there. I don't, 
can't tell. Let's see, where's that? Uh, oh, I've got two. I've got two uh, people, three people still out there. Any comments? And you want to chat? You can use your chat, or you can open up your mic and ask question. Questions here. Okay, good. So you'll be ready for the exam. Okay. All right. Thank you.